Uh, we are live now. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Marine Bellet uh, to give uh, a talk on microbes. Super exciting. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I will hide you now and keep my screen hot. So, uh, so I am Dr. Marine Bellet and I'm working at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology in Germany. Um, and today I'd like to present you uh, the chemical ecology of host microbes uh, in ocean. And, uh, but first of all, I'd like to present you a little bit uh, where we are sitting. So this is a picture of our city, Jena. It's uh, in the middle of Germany. And uh, it's a quite great place because uh, we have many research institutes and companies there, uh, such as the Leibniz Institute, uh, on Snow Institute, where they work on infection, um, short size, but also two Max Planck Institutes. And I'm working in the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology um, in the Max Planck Fellow Group uh, named Phytoplankton Community Interaction. And you have here a little bit of example of the keywords we are working with, uh, metabolomics, microalgae, and uh, so they look like this. Yeah. And of course, uh, we are actually quite far away from uh, the ocean. Yeah, Yena is here. So you have, uh, I hope you can see my, my mouse. Uh, we are in the middle here. And uh, I actually showed, so there's no distance, but I think it's like 10,000 uh, kilometers away from you guys. Um, I showed on this map several points where we are sampling our model organisms. So we go to Norway, to, we have samples from UK, from Brittany. Uh, Greece, and also from the North Sea, Elgoland, is also one of our main points. And our research approach is to combine um, uh, mainly experimental uh, lab studies. And uh, of course, we would like to go from the lab to the mesocosme to, to show our studies, uh, our observation are in the field. Yeah. Um, Okay, so we are working on algae. Uh, today I will present you the phytoplankton, so microalgae. And here you have video of uh, 40 liters of coastal waters concentrated through 100 micrometer nylon sieves. You have seen many grazers uh, that actually feed on the phytoplankton in the background and up here. Um, and you can see this sample is quite diverse, yeah? and we have many diverse types of cells living all together, and uh, these are actually very important because they represent the primary produ producers uh, of the ocean food webs. Uh, but today I will also talk about seaweed, uh, the macroalgae. We all have here pictures of lamina hadigitata which actually live also uh, as uh, in an interaction with many microbes. You have here a picture of uh, fungi that live within the host that is isolated on the petri dishes. And in the, uh, my lab, I'm working with this host um, and I'm studying the interaction between host and microbes. Okay. <coughs> ah, uh, welcome. I will admit a new member. Hello, uh, welcome. So, so this leads me to, um, I'd like to present you the, the a concept uh, that has been published already some years ago. Um, this is the phycosphere. So every algae is surrounded by chemicals. They produce chemicals. And we have kind of, a, it, we could compare this to the rhizosphere. Maybe you have heard of this, uh, where the, the roots of plants also can produce many exudates. And there is an area around this root, and it's also deduced around these algal cells that are presented here. This exudates when these chemicals are exchanged and are kind of a currency for, um, for interaction between microbes, such as bacteria on overs, protist, uh, with the cell. And um, what is interesting to note is that um, now I'd like to continue up, uh, is that, of course, um, this area can be different. Uh, the size of this phycosphere is relatively proportional to the size of the phytoplankton. You have here many different uh, 
type of cells represented. We have cyanobacteria, uh, cynecococcus, which are actually bacteria and not microalgae, right? But uh, they have been for a long time in the group of, uh, of uh, algae uh, uh, included. We have um, coccolithophobus, uh, green algae, chlaminomonas, and then we have several representatives of diatoms with cosinodiscus, ketoceros, thalassiocera. Uh, and then we have also some dinoflagellate there, alexandrium, um, or here, serratium. And um, in my group, we are mainly working with two clades of microalgae, the diatoms and the dinoflagellate. The main difference is uh, the diatoms are shells, uh, glass house, let's say, uh, which are not motile, most of them. Yeah, difference actually. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated, but most of them are not motile. Meanwhile, the dinoflagellate uh, are flagella and can move and swim around. Okay. So why are they so interesting? Actually, for us, uh, we know more the, the negative side of microalgae. They can produce toxins, uh, in particular, for example, like alexandrium, you have here uh, uh, sacitoxin, one of the toxins that can uh, cause paralytic poisoning uh, shellfish disease in humans. So unfortunately, uh, we can have frequent occurrence of blooms and of course this uh, mean many uh, high density of cells which can accumulate then in mollusks or fish and then of course when we consume uh, this contaminated uh, feed we can then consume the, the algae and then the, the toxin and that's that can be a problem can cause some disease uh, it's also to note that sometimes these toxins can be found in the in the hair, they can be produced as aerosols. So this is even more problematic uh, because then we can breathe it. Yeah? And what's interesting is that the ecology of these toxins are not well known. Uh, besides that, the grazers, which are eating dinoflagellate, can actually um, induce the production of these sassy toxins. Uh, this is quite interesting. So this is a type of chemical interaction. And on another hand, dinoflagellate are not only preyed upon by grazers, but also by uh, microbes such as parasite killers, so uh, little eukaryotes or protists, which can uh, completely decimate uh, populations. You have here healthy cells uh, seen under microscope, and we can add this parasite that we can control, such as Parvilucifera. And you have then um, a picture, a depiction of uh, kid uh, cultures with empty shells, and we have um, some infected cells and some healthy cells are still uh, present around because, of course, you always have some survivors. It's a bit like us getting infected, you will have some uh, immune or resistant cells. And uh, I have a small video showing you uh, actually infected and healthy cells. So I hope it will work great for you guys. And um, so you have here dinoflagellate swimming around. Uh, healthy cells and one cell here which is on the bottom is actually infected and what you're seeing is the uh, parasite uh, form oh I've been uh, stopped but I think I can start it again yeah so and uh, so this is uh, so many people are coming in at the wrong moment but it's no problem I will just keep on admitting people here yeah? Okay, uh, well, no, welcome no guys. Sure, no, no problem. Um, but welcome to the newcomers. And right now I'm presenting a small video of parasites and uh, dinoflagellates. So you have a close-up of an infected cell. And um, what we're seeing is the release actually of the parasites from the host, from the hardware host. Uh, so these little spores are actually just swimming around and trying to infect new hosts. And the healthy hosts are seen here swimming around and so on. We can see the little flagellum. And um, so this, this is quite cool, but actually we don't know anything about the chemical interaction of these organisms. Um, so this is uh, one of our research uh, topics in my book. We are looking at which chemicals are involved in the infection of these uh, dinoflagellates. Okay, so actually, I'd like now to present the life cycle of these uh, parasites. 
um, it's quite complex. It can have two types uh, of, like, of form. First, a free living form that you have seen, the zoospore. So this is quite small and can swim around to infect hosts. And what you're seeing next are pictures of cells, of a host cells infected. So it usually starts with a trophont, a feeding stage, where you can have the parasite staying on the top of the cell or getting inside and developing this kind of uh, mycelium inside the cells. And uh, whoops, a little bit too fast, because then a very crucial, critical, crucial step uh, for the parasites is the zoospore production. So this is when the parasite will produce, reproduce itself and uh, release this little zoospore once again. Actually, I, I put uh, two notes, but there are some resting stage uh, um, uh, possible, but we don't know actually how it looks like. So what I'm showing you today are two, uh, two model organisms. Uh, that I'm working with uh, in dinoflagellate and here in diatom. And I think I have maybe a small question. And I'd like to say, if you have question, yes. If you have question, please, please just ask away. You can interrupt me. Huh? Uh, it's a little bit of monologue, these Zoom things. It's not so nice. So if you have anything or it's too fast, don't hesitate to just uh, write down in the chat or, or bring up your voice. OK. I'm very interested in these protists. Uh, they are called parasitoid because they will almost kill their host. And um, actually, they can control the algal, algal population. They can contribute to the bloom termination, so also toxic bloom. So I would say this is kind of a pretty neat uh, organism. Yeah? And we don't know much about them. Actually, what we know is that they are uh, coexisting with their host in the ocean, a bit like virus and human, actually, uh, the same story, where uh, the host, the algae, will try to fight against this uh, little guy. And of course, this parasite will want to survive. So they will both evolve strategy of defense or more virulence to uh, survive. And one host, uh, the, the parasite needs the host to survive. So it's a type of uh, symbiosis, but a negative symbiosis. So it's a parasitism. OK. Um, so it's a little bit long to this. I don't know why it's so long. Okay, so this is a, an overview of what's happening in the ocean during a bloom. We have many algae uh, swimming around, which can produce a very diverse uh, structure, substance. You have seen uh, the picture of the structure for cytotoxins, but they are actually much more complex compounds like this. Here, uh, which is actually palytoxin, one of the aerosol toxic compounds, uh, or a very small compound like DMSP, which then is hydrolyzed in dimethyl sulfate. It's actually what uh, makes the smell of the ocean very strong. It smells a bit like uh, um, egg, but uh, not a good egg. <laughs> that's when you walk around, that's what you smell around when you walk on the beach. And of course, you have influencers. So you have seen some grazers. Uh, I did not talk at all about bacteria virus, but they are here in the ocean. And they also play a role. Oh, very, very fast. I'm so sorry. And uh, I've presented, I've just presented parasites. So these are eukaryotic cells. Uh, we will put them in the group of protists, even if protist is not uh, a taxonomic uh, clade, actually. Yeah, it's, it's a group of Everything, uh, everything that is not uh, bacteria or virus or greater, let's say. And uh, they contribute to bloom termination, partly. Yeah. Um, OK, and I put the name of some of the organisms we're working with. And if we look at this picture another, another way, so we have here, uh, let's say, a depiction of the common interaction we study in algal chemical ecology. So we have halelopathy, which is the interaction between two uh, algae for competition for resource or nutrients. They could produce a compound to, to kill each other, for example. We have pathogens like virus or parasites, which can infect and kill cells. We have grazers, which are feeding on these cells. And of course, we have um, biofilm formation. So you can also find a lot of these microalgae uh, on bending um, on sea floor surface 
or surface of boats and so on, and they will form biofilm. And uh, I've not present too much microalgae because they'll be coming up later in my talk, but uh, microalgae also uh, interact and uh, with others, they face competitors, they are grazed upon, and they live in symbiosis with bacteria or fungi. Yeah. And our uh, focus in our group is to study this different interaction and uh, elucidate the structure, the metabolites involved in this interaction. It's, a, I would say, quite a diverse group we are working with. Uh, today, I will present you mainly parasite microalgae organisms uh, interaction uh, and fungal uh, seaweed interaction. But in my group, uh, we, some of my colleagues have been working on sex pheromones and, and uh, oxylipines against uh, defense against grazers. But I will not talk about that today. OK, uh, I hope you have not so much questions so far, but uh, I will move on to the principle or uh, main challenge uh, of what we're doing. So we're studying the metabolo, and uh, we distinguish always the exometabolo, the substance which are released in the surrounding environment, and what we call the endometabolo, which is actually the metabolome of a cell. And why I distinguish both is because we have very different uh, approach to, to analyze this um, methodological approach. So we will do extraction, and the extraction will be done with different methods according to what we're looking at. We will use many different analytical um, mass spectrometers, for example, to, to get information on the wave of the molecules, but we use also spectrometric methods uh, such as uh, NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, and so on. And uh, today, I'd like not to go too deep into detail. Yeah, uh, it's I don't want it to be too boring about all the techniques possible, but we have we have many techniques. What we are challenge uh, our challenge actually working with uh, substance in water is that these substances are often lost in the overall noise. Let's say because you have many substances produced all together. And um, often in very low concentration, nano or femtomolar concentration, actually. So they can be degraded very fast. So actually, we have a lot of challenge to, um, to work with these uh, with this organisms, with these substances and organisms. Also, the fact that many of these organisms are difficult to cultivate. Yeah, that's also a thing uh, very important to us. OK. Uh, we have several tools, thankfully, available to us. So uh, we're doing natural product chemistry. Uh, you have some picture here. I ought to remove this here, but it's still not the best. At, okay. You have some, uh, some pictures showing up, uh, actually, biosphere guided fractionation. So we will extract algae and then um, separate the fraction according to their property if we have a non-polar or polar fraction. So we use different uh, solvents or um, analytical approach. And the point is that, of course, in one of these fractions is a bioactivity, for example, uh, inhibiting pathogen. Uh, here, in this case, it is a deterrent activity or grain scarcer. And of course, we will try to look for which compound is inside this fraction. So we will go and uh, several steps further to try to go until we have a pure substance that we can characterize. And this substance, then we can use it in biocell to test the activity against uh, physiology uh, or the life of other organisms and so on. So we're using mass spectrometry uh, approach. A bit of mistake here. So we have uh, typically chromatogram, and of course sometimes we cannot go to the to the pure substance. Yeah, that's not always possible. Sometimes we also want to look for pattern for difference between organisms. So we would have a control and treatment experiments, and we will uh, obtain profile metabolic profile, for example, and we will compare them using multivariate statistics. Uh, we will have, for example, making a principal component analysis. You have here 
one score plot showing you how it looks like at the result. And hopefully we could find pattern according to our, okay, we have control, we have treatment, and we have maybe a third group, and we can see, explain difference. Why do we find difference between them? Okay, so this is metabolomics. So metabolomics is actually not just one technique, but uh, uh, have a whole toolbox of uh, different uh, methods we're using to, to solve the metabolic change in our um, you know, so. so I'd like to now move on to one uh, recent example uh, we have been working on uh, on the parasites uh, infecting algae and now I will talk about diatoms so before I was talking about dinoflagellate and I will uh, I have again some videos I think it's quite cool because of to, how to remove this uh, I have no clue to remove this. I tried to, but when I click on it, it's uh, not moving on. So I'm pretty sorry, but well, it's not disturbing too much. So this video actually show um, the infection of a diatom, Cosinodiscus. So this is a widespread uh, diatom that we can find actually in many oceans. Maybe you already have seen it uh, close to your, to your place if you take a sample under the microscope. And uh, what you're seeing is the last stage, the release of the zoospore once again. It looks quite different indeed uh, from, from what happened before with uh, dinoflagellate because it's a normal seed in this case. So uh, what's very interesting is that on the left side, you're seeing a video from 1969 from a German colleague uh, <laughs> from very long time ago. And what you're seeing on the, on the other side is actually uh, the, the system we have, again, isolate and establish in our lab. A uh, little bit less active, I have to admit, but uh, this is still the same parasite uh, that we're working with. And thanks to our new methodology, we could go further and look at the, the mechanisms um, behind this infection. So our model organisms is uh, Lagenisma cosinodici, which is a specialist parasite of the host uh, cosinodiscus. You have here some pictures of the zoospore, uh, the sporangium. So this is the last, uh, this uh, zoospore, uh, this uh, trough, uh, this, uh, this is the last stage of uh, infection when you have production of the zoospore. And you have different hosts. So we are working with highly susceptible hosts. And we also look at uh, resistant hosts, which cannot be infected or less infected. And we'd like to know, OK, what are the chemicals uh, involved in this interaction? Are involved in the infection of the host or involved in the defense? Yeah. And so we start working with a very highly susceptible uh, Diatom, which is uh, Cosinodiscus grania, and we use this setup. So this is a, a co-cultivation experiment uh, in this uh, glass flask, which actually are made of two parts. And in the middle, uh, uh, we have the membrane of, uh, of 0.22 micrometers pores. So no um, cells can pass through, not even the parasites. So we could have a healthy population uh, against healthy cells, yeah, as a control. But in our treatment, we could put different type of population. The healthy cells, but exposed actually to exudate from a population of infected cells. And what is great is that with this system, we can then sample over time. We can sample the cells to look at the cellular metabolome, or we can sample the medium to look at the exudate, what's in the exudate. And what we've been doing is to work on the population of cells. We could extract the population of cells of these different uh, treatments, analyze it with um, liquid chromatography coupled to isolation mass spectrometry, and uh, find, uh, the find actually that this population, the, their metabolic profile, could discriminate very well uh, between the healthy cells, the exposed cells, which are healthy, but still exposed to, to what is released by the infected cells, and of course, the infected cells. So this is a, a PCA, principal component analysis score plots. And of course, behind this statistical analysis is actually adding metabolites. So we proceed to identify the metabolites um, that were uh, changing, regulated during the infection, 
And uh, we have here uh, an example, a list of some of these metabolites. And this was very interesting because we actually found uh, two alkaloids. So these are a group of uh, quite a class of compounds, which is quite uh, interesting. Um, it's producing many bioactive, uh, it comp there is include many bioactive compounds uh, also used as drug and so on uh, for human. And uh, they were help regulated during the infection. So uh, you have here the structure of one of them, beta carboline. And this was uh, interesting for us. Why? Because we could buy as a commercial standard this compound and we could continue our experiments with this. But uh, to prove the function of these uh, molecules, we actually use the commercial standards and add it to the cultures. And then we proceed to follow the growth and uh, to follow what's happening when we try to infect it. And what we could find is that when we had this compound, we actually uh, inhibit the, the growth, the cell division uh, at 24 micromolar uh, of concentration for both compounds. And when we, of course, look at the, then the rate, the speed of infection, uh, we also uh, speed up the infection. Because, of course, if you have cells which are not dividing anymore, your population is basically controlled and uh, the parasite can infect more and faster. And even when we look at the cells, they looked uh, actually there's something different in their phenotype. So you have here healthy cells, uh, you have infected cells, so they look like, so this is the beginning, you have little spore attached to the cell, so the parasite. And here you have the first stage where you see a deformation and basically the cell is being killed and eaten from the inside. Yeah? So this is what's happening and uh, the parasite needs place to then develop. And when we add the compound to healthy cells, we actually saw a similar phenotype with this. Uh, so this, for, for those who know uh, more about plant physiology, this is what we call plasmolysis. So we have uh, the vacuole forms inside the, the cells and you even have um, uh, the, the cells, which is yeah uh, not anymore attached to the membrane, to the cell wall. You know? And uh, so this proves that indeed the compounds are help regulated during the infection. They actually contribute to the oomycete pathogenesis. And we could even prove that uh, at the single cell level. So first of all, the parasite use the, the algae from the host, the, the metabolite from the host, because these are compounds produced by the algae. And we could find, we quantify uh, that indeed it's upregulated during infection at the population level, but also at the single cell level. We did another type of analysis called MALDI, uh, MALDI MS. I uh, can answer a little bit more about that later, but um, the, the take home message is we could indeed uh, confirm that most all cells of the population uh, have the same phenomena. They all produce more. Uh, of these compounds when they are infected. And we could even visualize these compounds because they are, uh, we can see their uh, fluorescence. So we use uh, confocal laser scanning microscopy to, uh, to, op to visualize the, the compound accumulating over the course of the infection. You have here the chlorophyll A, the pigments, uh, the autofluorescence of the pigments, and here you have a fluorescence specific to the compound. And we could really see that indeed, uh, you see here the last stage, all this green mean that this compound is really produced all over the, the fungal. Okay, so the, mani the parasite manipulate the host. It's hijacking actually the metabolome to use it uh, for, for succeeding and infecting. And this is actually, I would say, not something so surprising because this is uh, maybe a tale of coevolution. Yeah. Uh, especially these parasites are specific specialists to their host, so they need their host to reproduce. So it's uh, totally normal that they would have this kind of hijack, uh, hijacking and using the host to develop itself and using the metabolites. This is something that we can see in uh, terrestrial plants, actually. Uh, but we were the first to show it uh, in oceans, in an aquatic uh, model. Uh, and um, of course, what's next is that we look at the defense because we'd like to know uh, 
what's happening when host cannot be infected anymore. And we're using the same uh, setup of co-culture to put susceptible hosts and resistant hosts um, against each other, plus or, or not parasite. And our idea is to then look, OK, is there chemicals released uh, by the resistant host that can uh, maybe stop the infection, inhibit the infection? maybe a lytic compound. And uh, so far, so nicely put, we had uh, found some resistant host and we're looking at the uh, different strategy against this parasite. I cannot say too much because we are still uh, doing experiment and uh, we don't have yet a uh, name of metabolite, but hopefully maybe in one year or two, we can, um, I can, ex we can explain more about what's happening there. Okay. And um, actually, I'd like to present you another uh, approach we developed in our lab. I'm not so sure this is something so useful for, that could be useful for you guys, because we, we, we work really, this, this technique uh, is based on MALDI. So um, we have, uh, again, it's another type of uh, mass spectrometry approach, which can give us information on the, uh, metabolome of algae. And what's peculiar is that we work with living cells, which are still in the environment, and uh, we don't need any matrix to enhance uh, ionization. And we can uh, really just analyze them by disruption. So we have a, a laser, actually, that targets cells. We target cells with a laser. The cells are disrupt. And when they're disrupt uh, ions, the metabolites are, are produced as ions, and then our mass spec is detecting these ions. Um, so why is this nice is that I told you before, not everything is growing in the lab. And why did we develop this is actually what could be really nice is that if we go in the ocean and just take some samples, few cells, could it give us information like what is the name of these cells? Is it in fact? Is it in good shape? Uh, what is it? Is it a toxic algae? So I would say that this method for now is still, we have not yet given the full truth of what we could do with this method, but we start to develop uh, this method in, in these objectives, in this aim, to then be, um, e it's easier to work with things which are not cultivable. But of course, as proof of principle, we had to first work in the lab with lab cultures, and uh, we developed this workflow where we analyze, again, its metabolomics. So we compare metabolome of uh, cells, but it's not anymore one point uh, an extract or population. One point then is one cell, which is very, very, uh, how to say, uh, powerful, because then we could really see maybe one cell is different from the others. Of course, does these cells really matter in the whole population? That's another question. But uh, we are doing uh, something called single cell metabolomics. OK. And thanks to this method, we start to, to, to check what we could do, uh, what kind of application we could do. So first, we, could, uh, we check if we could um, identify algae. So it's uh, actually this. Please move this window away from the chart. No, how to remove this? But well, from time to time, it's it's going away. Well, okay. So uh, this workflow presents you what we have been doing. So I told you before, we sample in the fields. We did uh, field sampling, but also took from culture collection. We identified still the cells with uh, with ever sequencing or morphologic criteria. Um, and uh, then we analyze with our method these cells. And uh, basically, we, we build a library of uh, collection cells. And we then test our method if it was um, uh, good enough to assign the identity to say, OK, we have an Alexandrium, we have a Cosinodiscus, and how many, and so on. So this is kind of a fingerprinting profiling. Uh, we could indeed, uh, we were working not with so many cells, uh, a few hundreds, it's actually not much because you can have billions of cells in the ocean. Yeah? But uh, this was a proof of principle um, application to show that yes, with this method, single cell metabolomics, we can identify the taxonomy and uh, we can 
actually also address some uh, physiology. So if the next step would be to test uh, nutrients depleted cells and so on. And I talk a lot about parasites and disease of, of microalgae. So could we then find maybe marker of this disease? So this is also something that, uh, that is in development in the lab. So we have our different models of diatome, dinoflagellate, a different infection stage, and we have very different parasites uh, that we're working with. We analyze them with this method. And with multivalent statistics, we can then assign the health and say, OK, this cell is infected by this parasite, strain, whatever, and so on. So this is another work uh, in preparation right now. Uh, but uh, so far, with the model we work with, it works. So this really shows that these single cell metabolomics can really uh, address question in plankton interaction. Uh, so this will be cool to first continue further and see what else uh, we could do with it. Okay, but now I come to my uh, next topic. Uh, what about seaweeds, I would say. So I've been talking a lot about microalgae and we look at very small organisms, yeah, 20 micrometers. So it's, it's very small. It's basically uh, some of them are maybe not even bigger than the pinhead of this uh, needle. But uh, now, what about seaweed? That's actually the algae we can see. We can uh, enjoy maybe a bath in it, yeah, if you're into this. You can eat it because we, we cultivate it or at least uh, prepare uh, some delicacy like sushi with it. And um, actually, they are also very important for the global uh, cycle in, on Earth because they also release a lot of products. They live in interaction with microbes, and um, it's not just to make sushi, but they contribute to the to the global uh, oxygen that we that we breathe in, and so on. Yeah. So uh, they are very intensively um, produced. Uh, this not uh, the latest update, but actually, uh, uh, I think it was like three years ago, 40, 14 million tons. I'm not so sure in your area if you produce it or just collect it and so on. Uh, sometimes like in Asia, so this is quite actually to see, it really is quite uh, incredible. It's, uh, this is aquaculture, so this has no scale bar here, but actually it's like five kilometers. Yeah? So this is a huge aquaculture field. And of course, uh, the problem of culti so big cultivation is that uh, you have attraction of uh, many, many microbes and also parasites. So they love to feed on this. And you can imagine that may, it's also there's a phycosphere here. Yeah? They also have phycosphere. They produce exudate. And this exudate attracts many opportunities. And this opportunist uh, are caused by microbes, which can be pathogen. So you have, for example, um, uh, Saccharina latissima, the, the sweet, the sweet uh, brown algae, yeah, well cultivated for many applications which is uh, infected by bacteria. It's making this, uh, this uh, spot disease. Maybe I don't know if anybody's working with this uh, in your labs uh, or I've seen this when you were just going to field. You have also all my seeds. So all my seeds, like the one that I present you with title. So this is here Porphyra, another very cultivated species for the nori production, infected by Pythia. Uh, you have this spot here. This these colored spots, and then you have Ectocarpus, it's a filamentous algae, which also can be infected by an omycid called Eurycasmatic Sony. And so far, there's no cure or treatment. Uh, the only way to deal with this disease is just to put a lot of acids in the ocean to clean out everything, but it's uh, not very ecologically friendly. Yeah. So one idea would be to make maybe this algae more resistant, like what we've done for plants. For terrestrial plants, we have a lot of cultivars which are more resistant to, to disease or to pests. Why not do the same with uh, seaweed? And seaweed, uh, as I said, work with many microbes. So microbes that can live on the surface, uh, they are called epiphytes, or microbes that can live in the tissue, and they are then called endophytes. Yeah? So this is just a schematic of it. And of course, microbes will live at the holders, so uh, in this area where the algae is attached, but also in the 
the steep or uh, the wall talus here. Yeah? And um, of course, you can imagine that it's everything is like, a, like, we could compare it to human and microbes. So you have, of course, good microbes and uh, bad microbes, let's say, to make it a little bit, uh, uh, maybe a little bit too easy. But uh, this is, if uh, seaweed is in good health, there should be a lot of good microbes inside. Of course, if the seaweed is stressed, maybe the opportunist will take over. And um, we were prospecting. So this is part of my PhD thesis work, actually. Uh, so not at the Max Planck, but uh, at the museum, uh, at the Natural History Museum of Paris in France, we were looking for anti-parasite compounds, and uh, we were thinking, okay, maybe the microbes which live in association with the seaweed, like fungi or bacteria, maybe they produce interesting compounds which uh, can be useful for uh, killing this opportunist. So the method, the approach was to cultivate the microbes, so isolate, uh, for example, fungi from the tissue, then identify them, yeah, because we had to check what it is. And uh, then the idea was, OK, let's do biosec guided purification. So let's extract, uh, test these extracts again, pathogens, and then the fraction look for, try to, to purify a substance. And of course, we had to identify this substance. And uh, there's still work going on right now, but of course, uh, I'm still working partly on it, I would say, but from far away now, uh, we are doing genome, they are doing genome sequencing and mining for new components. Yeah. But the, the overall objectives was this. And uh, I can present you two examples of products that we have uh, identified. So one product was uh, where this, were called pyrenocytes. So these are small polyketides. They are produced by these fungi. So this is how it looks like when it's growing on a petri dish. It's with agar, with special agar, with uh, all the nutrients medium, uh, all the nutrients that it needs for growing. And of course, this was coming from a seaweed. And I'm pretty sure you know this one. It's Ascophila nodosum. Uh, it's a uh, Actually, it's quite used for the industry, but not for food consumption, more for producing agars and alginates and so on. And we had a bioassay, a pretty, uh, I would say, another type of bioassay, where we were putting two algae. It's again a co cultivation experiment where we're putting a healthy algae and an infected algae. And in this medium, we were also putting the extract of a pure substance to check if the substance could inhibit the infection of this algae by, by again, this the same parasite that produced so for yes. So it was released and swimming around. So the idea was, OK, we want to find a compound that inhibits the production. And uh, by using this biose and, uh, of course, doing all the, the work behind for purifying, identifying this structure, we, we detect uh, a family of pyrenocytes, and two of them could actually inhibit the infection. Uh, I have another video. I think it's better with Zoom <laughs> to have some video to make it a little bit more interactive. Um, so what you're seeing here is actually uh, the Novi culture. So I think I don't know how to remove this. Each time I move my mouse, it's showing up. Uh, but what you're seeing are actually infected cells. So the brown cells are the happy cells, the healthy cells, but all the cells with this greenish here are infected cells. And uh, what I want to show you is that um, we add the compounds that were purified and isolated to this culture of uh, nori. So this is piropia. This is actually a red algae, yeah? not a brown one. Um, it killed actually uh, the, the parasite. So if you see here, this is the infected cells. We, we see some of these infected cells. It's maybe not so clear here, but uh, we, we had this in triplicate and so on. But ah, yeah, when we had, um, we had the, the compound, it killed the infected cells. So actually, we don't have a compound that is making uh, resistant. Uh, algae, yeah. In this case, we we have a compound that kills directly the parasite. So this could be uh, maybe uh, something that uh, 
could be useful when we have already the infected culture. But of course, if we don't know yet what's the mechanisms uh, behind this, or does it work? So we still have a, uh, there's still a lot of work to do to look further into this. But we publish this. Of course, we have uh, patents pending for this kind of work, especially for our co collaborator in South Korea. They are very interested because they have a lot of trouble with their cultures. Um, and they are looking always for solutions. And uh, uh, this, uh, where I think it's over, but yes. And now I'd like to show a second example of compounds, uh, which we recently published. Uh, these are small, small butanolids, so it's another type of compound uh, that were also isolated from fungi, and uh, they disrupt something called quorum sensing. So quorum sensing is uh, actually a mechanism of communication of bacteria. So let's imagine we have bacteria cells here, this one, and these are the small quorum sensing compound. It's actually a, a very specific class of compound called homocellin lactones. Uh, I tried to be light in chemistry, but <laughs> I'd like not to be too light, yeah? it's not very specialized. Um, so the important information is that at low density, you don't have so much of these uh, compounds produced, or not enough actually to trigger it. But when you have a high density of cells, many cells together, then you will have it will trigger the production of, of this, and then it will form biofilm. Biofilm is something like this. So of course it's not just bacteria, but bacteria are usually the first microbes which uh, start initiate biofilm. And then it will recruit many of the organisms, algae, grazers, and so on, that will come and attach itself, and, and so on. And um, during my PhD, I worked with Paradendrifiella salina, another quite uh, complex name. They always have these crazy names, these uh, microorganisms from time to time. It's actually a marine fungi uh, living in the ocean, only in the ocean. You cannot find it on a tree. Uh, it has some halogenolytic activities, so this means that it actually can eat away the tissue of uh, seaweed. So this is this a good guy? We don't know, but what is sure is that we detect this, we identified this butenolite, and uh, these compounds could inhibit uh, the, the biofilm production of some pathogenic bacteria. And uh, this was quite interesting because we show that this fungi. Um, or I would say even bacteria. I did not talk about bacteria at all, but they are also there and some work has been done and is worked on that. They can produce a lot of bioactive substance, which might be useful for the, for the seaweed. But of course, we don't know uh, what's the role of this, of this substance for the host. Uh, why? Because uh, it's quite difficult to grow in the lab of uh, seaweed. Yeah? It will take months. So, uh, of course, what would be great is to grow, to be able, like the diatom or the dinoflagellate, to grow it in the lab and then hide the substance and check, does it change something for the health, for the fitness of the host, and so on, and so on, and so forth. Uh, but well, this is another story. Okay, um, so um, I will conclude, and I uh, hope I was not too fast, and I'm quite sorry, actually, uh, because there was this uh, time time problem, but I hope everything's fine for you guys. Uh, so I present today uh, in some example of host symbiont interaction using algae and microbes, uh, microalgae, seaweeds, and, and then I really focus on this parasite. I have to say this is kind of uh, my main project at the moment. But the take home message is that you have many diverse natural products, uh, often bioactive compounds, so compounds which can uh, affect the life of others. I would say for now, we don't know yet uh, how it can be useful for us as humans. But of course, if you imagine something that can stop a biofilm, we can maybe test uh, this compound against human pathogens that are doing biofilm uh, in human or on surface in hospital and so on. So this, all of these substances have always uh, could have another aim for us. So we're doing algal chemical ecology, and this was actually a very first a small blinked uh, insight into what we're doing. This is this field is quite large. There's many um, organisms in interaction. So 
we could talk for hours about all of this, um, but I hope, yes, that you got the main message of what we're doing in this field, what tools we're using. So I present a little bit of uh, the omits. Um, I tried not to be too in depth. I didn't want to be too too complex. I hope if you have questions, well, just ask. And I want to finish by this uh, by this by saying, okay, we we really are still have a lot to find in the ocean. We don't we don't need so much to go in the in space actually because there's still so much to see. If you take a microscope, you can find so many new organisms that cannot be cultivated that might produce a lot of interesting substance and that has very very interesting life. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and of course, I'd like to acknowledge um, my group's uh, leader, Professor Georg Ponat. Um, uh, my co-worker, Tim Baumeister, will uh, soon defend his thesis. So, soon, Dr. Baumeister. We're working also with uh, two, two, uh, two colleagues, Dr. Kaftan and Svatos, in the Max Planck Institute. Um, they, they developed an, uh, the single cell analysis together with us. We, of course, I thanks the panel group, and we have here a couple of uh, collaborators. Uh, wow, incredible, too fast. <laughs> couple of collaborators in, in Europe, uh, in Paris, uh, in Scotland, in Frankfurt, in Germany, but also in France, in Roscoff, we, we collaborate. Um, yes, okay. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope, uh, yes, that you got it all. And if you have any question, I'll be very happy to, to answer you. Great, thank you so much. Um, does anybody have any questions uh, to start off? Oh, I think uh, Ignacio had to leave to catch the, the last bus uh, from the lab, but uh, he just, I think is going to put a question in the, the chat box. I know that he had one. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, and sorry guys, I want to say thanks a lot for uh, inviting me to present our research. Really, really, thanks a lot. That was very nice. Uh, I Really, thanks a lot. So yes, first, uh, yes. Jacent Tandem. I don't think it's your full name, but <laughs> ask away, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, uh, um, my name is Javier Santander. And nice presentation. Nice. Uh, hi, Javier. So I, I have a couple of questions uh, from my ignorance. So in the, the, the first topic that you talk uh, about the infection with this parasite and, and uh, macroalgae. So you, you mentioned that in one of these uh, metabolites is the beta carboline. Yes. Was... Uh, uh, heavily synthesized or uh, during infection. So my, my question, how do you know that this metabolite came from the uh, host or the parasite? Uh, because we could detect it in very, very small quantity in healthy cells, very small quantity. And that is why our hypothesis is that algae can produce it. Oh. Okay. So what we could show is really upregulation. So because we had the compounds, we could quantify them. We could inject at different concentration okay. and compare this concentration in the samples of healthy and infect, and we could find this upregulation. So, the, but but exists the possibility that the parasite itself secrete this compound? Yes. Yes. Of course. Uh, the thing is, we're looking at uh, hybrid organisms, uh, especially omycetes. Omycetes are a group of parasites which uh, have actually not so much capability to produce substance. So in this case, um, I would say that most of the time, what you detect is coming from the host, because these parasites don't have so much ability. They have to use the machinery of the host. That's why they usually hijack. But you have so many different parasites that actually can also um, produce their own compounds. Oh. The only problem is uh, to be sure that it comes from the parasite and not the algae. Yeah. So I would say then you would have to, to look at, you know, the little those spores that swim around? You could recover that and analyze them. Mm. And then you could say, okay, this belongs to the parasite. So this parasite, uh... I do imagine at some point should be free living. 
Yes, at some point you have them free living. This is actually this those spore, this little spore swimming. Ah. That's a very important form because this is the form for reproduction to go in the surrounding and add, uh, infect new host. And this form is just the parasite alone. The problem is uh, this form can live just few hours. So it's really um, it's a bit tricky to handle this form. Uh, I will say that you have to, to be there at the right time to recover them. And of course, when you look in the ocean, you would have to be uh, really looking at a huge amount of water to, to, to recover that. Not only because you have not only one parasite living together, so maybe you have many of these little spores coming from different uh, type of organisms. So then you would have to distinguish which one is which, but honestly, you need DNA sequencing, so you need to extract the DNA to know what what is it. Yeah. Then, I have one question more. Sure. So it's very interesting. How you isolate a, a a host that is resistant to the infection? How you? Uh, so, so actually, we saw it becoming resistant in the lab. So mm. we had um, <clears throat> the culture that could be infected, and we transfer. As we cannot maintain the parasite alone, we always put some infected cells with healthy culture. But what happened is at one point, uh, the culture could not be infected anymore. So there was some kind of genetic mutation mm. and um, somehow the new cells could not be infected. Uh, so this is something that can happen, not necessarily often actually, and uh, most, you can also do another way. You can just take as much force as possible from different species and strain, and then you just add parasite to it. And then you see, you, you monitor who is getting infected or not. And then you can also say, ah, okay, I have this group of species, it's never infected. And uh, do, yeah. Do you have some idea how they become resistant? So, and we're looking at what is happening. We think maybe it's the cell wall, something's going on, but there's no recognition because this spore come and attach and it must attach to a receptor or something. And maybe the receptor change. And this is again a story of substance, maybe proteins or metabolites, which are different, the composition different. There's also another hypothesis. Maybe the cells start to produce a compound that is released and that kill the parasite. A bit like what we have found for this uh, anti-parasite. It's kind of uh, like this. Maybe something is released and uh, disrupt all the cells and then kill actually the, the cells or stop stop the swimming or... But we don't know yet, actually. This is um, something we look into because uh, what we know is that if we can compare with plants. So because these organisms are related phylogenetically to the parasite of plants, Mm. So we can compare what we know for Arabidopsis, which is a very uh, plant mm. model, a very important plant model, um, and Phytophthora, which is another uh, model of Omycete. And usually, receptor on the membrane are involved. So it means that maybe receptor on membrane are also involved in our case. But uh, yeah, well, we have to do more experiments <laughs> because we uh, cannot know. Thank you so much. Yes, you're welcome. Yes. Chris Parrish here. Um, very nice presentation, really interesting stuff. Uh, you did mention oxylipins, but you decided not to talk about them. It's a bit of a shame because a couple of us, at least a couple of us in the audience are uh, uh, very interested in lipids and mass spectrometry, but that may be for another time. I was um, interested in, you talked about bloom uh, termination and we would normally think about it being a function of inorganic nutrients of uh, maybe silica drops out for diatoms, maybe nitrate for dinoflagellates. Uh, so is there a connection here that uh, healthy cells that have all the nutrients are resistant and then as soon as they start losing inorganic nutrients, they suddenly become infectable? Yes, uh, your point is very, uh, it's very uh, crucial because you're, you're, it's actually something we see. If you don't have uh, healthy cells or in good shape, it can be more um, susceptible to opportunists. So we have such op observation with the parasite we're working with. And uh, I was talking about bloom termination because there's one study in, um, in my 
but my coworker did at Roscoff, where they could coincide, they could simultaneously find many of these pearls at the uh, when the bloom was stopped. And that's why it has been hypothesized that the bloom is terminated. But I will say, um, my opinion is for parasites, it's not a good idea to kill all the host, right? So maybe you can have an event where you have maybe a higher temperature or different uh, things, different nutrients playing in role. And maybe the parasite at this point, it's far for the parasite that kill all the population at once. But I think what's happening in the ocean is that you have always host and parasite coexisting. And the parasite doesn't want to kill all the host, otherwise, how can it reproduce? So I think it's uh, it's more control. There must be for sure control of your population, but it's a kind of a, a dynamic system. Yeah, um, I, I'm, I believe that, of course, parasite won't be the solution to terminate bloom, but uh, for sure, there is a story of coevolution that is very interesting because what, what interests me is that, okay, maybe uh, the host is producing uh, something and then the parasite will find a way to evade, escape this defense. And this we don't know anything about it. Yeah. But uh, I would say nutrients for me is one of the main, uh, to my knowledge, it's one of the main uh, explanation for this bloom. Yeah. And for sure, from a metabolic point of view, uh, what you give to the to the algae will change their metabolic production. You can see it when you have nutrients depleted cells; they will not produce the same thing. Also, the growth phase. So I think this is um, our lab. Exp we have. To, I'm very realistic that our lab experiments will not, will not explain what we see in the ocean because then we also um, have allelopathy interaction and so on. So. Uh, yeah, but thanks and sorry for the oxylipids. I have to admit this is another talk. Uh, so we are looking actually for oxylipids uh, in the resist, um, in the defense uh, project because oxylipids are indeed uh, used for defense against grazers and so on. And this is one big piece in, in Georg's lab. Uh, so, well, <laughs> I'd like to say more when I have more results. <laughs> but yes, All it's... Right, uh, Thank you. That, that'll be for next time. Thanks. Yes. Thanks a lot for your comment. Yeah. Johanny. Hi, uh, I'm Johanny Marinho. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. It was great. Um, so I have two questions. The first is more about the ecology of the systems. Uh, and I was wondering, you showed in the map that you have different sampling locations across the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. So I was wondering if there are any seasonality effects or um, yeah, any differences uh, among the places that could affect these interactions that you talked about. And the second question is a little bit more personal about your career path. Um, so I am finishing my PhD soon at Memorial and I was wondering if you have any advice for finding a postdoc position at an MPI. Okay. Uh, so regarding the seasonality, I cannot say much because we did not uh, study that. So we did not sample over uh, the year, one, one time a month, uh, to check the diversity. This is something that has been done by some co-worker for parasite dynamics, to check for parasites. Uh, so it's, it's hard for me to say. I can just say from what I'm reading from the literature that, yes, you can, you can find difference. So you will not have always, um, how to say, uh, the same species that you're encountering in the ocean. It will follow the seasons. What we know, for example, is that Cosinodiscus bloom is always from August to November every year. So you will come and sample, you will find them. If you come in January, maybe you will not find so many of them. And of course, if you have an extreme event, maybe you have higher temperature or something, maybe you will find a bit less. But I, I would say that what has been found by all the, the scientists working in the marine stations and who are doing monitoring is that the phenomenon is quite uh, cyclic. But every year at the same period, you will find the same group of species living together. It's a little bit of this, uh, of this uh, yeah, uh, it's, it, they will come back. And I have to admit, so far, we don't have uh, much it would be great to, to check a little bit more into this, but I cannot say much more uh, <laughs> besides this. Um, Carapath. Um, so 
I, I did my PhD for three years and I was really lucky just at the end of my PhD, I saw an advertisement of this position. Uh, so I've been postdoc now for four years. Um, I'm actually now looking for assistant professorship or uh, getting my own funding to start my own group. Um, so I think it's just a matter of finding the position uh, that fits the most your skills. So you need to apply to something that makes sense regarding your aspiration, what you want to develop. And uh, I was told to change everything, the topic and the methods. So when I started my postdoc, actually I did not know about metabolics. <laughs> I learned by going on workshops and uh, yeah, learning by, by doing, let's say. And um, it's quite good because it also makes you, uh, let's say, you need to, to become a, a research, prof you need to build your research profile. So if you want to stay in research in, in public uh, science, it's quite, important to, to show something about you that really, for example, me, I know now that I really want to work on microbial interaction using metabolomics because this is what I'm uh, very skilled at and things like this. And I think it's not so difficult to get into the Max Planck Institute. It's just important to find the funding or the opportunity at the right time. They will also care about your publication track. So you need to show that you're quite independent and can publish. And work by net, also your networking is very important. My, my supervisors from during my PhD wrote, I guess, or contact my current supervisor. So the networking is very important. It's what defines me. So it's not so complicated to get position here. Actually, there's a lot of postdoc position in Germany, for example many, many postdocs here. And I would say one of the biggest problem is too many postdocs, because then if you want to get permanent position, there's no permanent position here. So it's, it's they will be very happy to get you for postdoc, but uh, for long-term positions, it's quite difficult. I think only 4% of the PhD students here uh, finish, uh, get a, a permanent position in public academia. So it's, it's really complicated, yeah. And of course, you have the visa, the visa thing, but I think it's not so much a problem. There's many postdocs around me from uh, all over the world, which come, they have visa and they're working. You have usually one, two years contract that can be renewed if you get a publication. <laughs> That's the thing, I got renewed because it worked and we have, a, we have things going on. So yeah, does that, does that help you all for? Yes, thank you so much. Don't hesitate if you have, uh, if you need, I can send some CV around uh, if you need any help or you can contact me, I can, I can contact people and once you are inside uh, the field, it's, everybody know each other when you go to the conference then, and so it's quite easy to say and for example, uh, I know some groups which are looking for postdoc uh, post so that's why it's networking is very important. Um, because then I could tell you, oh yeah, there is someone I know who's looking for postdoc to work on this topic and so on, you can apply. Then I will write to the, to the colleague immediately say, oh, I know someone who would like to apply and so on, then you get in touch and, and that's how it is, yeah. Good luck eh, with your application. Okay. <laughs> Probably have time for maybe one more question if there's anybody that uh, wants to ask. We've got a lot of questions, so I think that's great. We got some. Obviously, it must have been a, it has been a really great presentation to get some new questions going. So yes, thanks a lot again, and thanks for your also your question because I was not expecting them. So it's great to have because you it's great because you're the, the best public. You ask people completely odd. Uh, I guess at least odds of uh, people I'm addressing often. So it's good for me to know what people are interested in when they look at my or research topic. Okay, well, it doesn't seem like there's any more questions. So thank yes. you again so much. Um, yes, shall I uh, release this screen or? Uh, sure, if you want, uh, yeah. Um, that's fine. Stop share, right? Okay, so now you're you're back to being the host. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, 
everybody, re I really enjoyed it. Um, it sounds like everybody else did as well. So um, and if we get any other questions, uh, we'll just email you. So. Super. Thanks, bye. Thanks, bye-bye. Have a nice evening. Thank you.